In this second uh, video lecture on the 1930s, the road to World War II, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off at the end of video lecture number one with this chilling image of the uh, aftermath of a Japanese aerial attack on a Chinese city. Uh, and again, um, you can see the, again, the brutality and the inhumanity that is going to characterize war, starting with uh, this war, World War II, and then uh, all the way down to present times. Uh, I heard on the uh, radio this morning, uh, in fact, that uh, Russian airplanes had apparently bombed uh, hospitals in Syria. So this type of warfare is still with us after almost 70, uh, 80 years. So we're going to move forward now from Asia. We're going to turn our attention to Europe. Um, and we, what we see here is a picture of Adolf Hitler and the German president, Paul von Hindenburg, in 1933. And in large part, due to the suffering and the uncertainty caused by the Depression, Adolf Hitler becomes the chancellor of the German government. Now, chancellor is a position that is not familiar to most of us, but uh, in the German system of government at the time, the chancellor was uh, the like our president, so the head of the German government. They just called that person chancellor, and the chancellor is appointed by the actual president. Um, so it's kind of funny that the president uh, has less power uh, than the chancellor, but actually appoints the chancellor. So here's what you see in 1933. And in large part, again, it's the depression. It's the economic misery and suffering of the people that convince uh, people like the president of Germany and other conservatives, leading conservatives and industrialists in Germany, that Adolf Hitler might be the right man at, at the right time. So uh, he becomes chancellor, and then he quickly establishes a one-man, one-party dictatorship. So one man, one party dictatorship. Uh, and how does he do that? Well, he alleges, uh, as we saw with Japan, uh, he alleges that the Communist Party in Germany, a fairly large party and somewhat popular, again, think of the misery and suffering. He says, uh, Adolf Hitler, that is, says that the Communist Party uh, tried to burn down the German parliament building, the, the seat of the German government in, in Berlin, and that's a building known as the Reichstag. And uh, so this event, this incident is called the Reichstag fire and it allowed Hitler then to claim that the German government was under attack by communists and socialists and people that uh, were uh, um, intent on overthrowing the government and Hitler then uses police powers and Hitler of course had a large police force that he commanded as the leader of the Nazi party and they're able to quickly suppress all uh, other political parties and, and quickly establish a again a one dictator one party state uh, by 1934 so within a year uh, Hitler is in power now Hitler had been the head of the, uh, involved with the Nazi party all the way dating back to 1919 and I think then what is clear and what you might ask, why do we have to go back to 1919? Well, that was again the end of World War One, the Paris Peace uh, Conference that didn't go very well uh, for Germany. Um, Germany is blamed for the war. Germany has to pay back huge sums of money. Remember, they're called reparations. Uh, but just what's also interesting, I think, and confusing to some students is the idea that the Nazi party was not all that popular during the 1920s. And you can see there um, some election results. So prior to 1928, or actually in the 1928 elections held in Germany, the Nazi party received less than 3% of the vote. Uh, however, two years later, 1930, and then again in 1932, uh, the Nazi party is winning 35% of the vote, and it was the biggest single party in German politics. You notice that they have elections more frequently than we do in our political system where we have presidential elections every four years. So that's just the nature of the German uh, uh, political system. So uh, really what then explains Hitler and the Nazi party rise to dominance? Again, the Great Depression and the financial it, it collapse, the uncertainty, the suffering, and the misery. So one wonders, without the Great Depression, would there have been an Adolf Hitler in Germany? And it's a question that we can't answer, but it's, uh, I think, worth thinking about. Um, so what does Hitler do once he becomes the one-man dictator with at the head of the Nazi party? He embarks on a very aggressive and a very ambitious program uh, to build up the German military. And here you see one of the German military parades that uh, the Nazi party liked to stage frequently uh, as an attempt to publicize uh, 
what he was up to, uh, and that is building up a large military. Now, this is supposed to uh, reassure the German people that Hitler was, in fact, the right man at the right time. Uh, these, 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 this military buildup created a lot of jobs in the uh, weapons industry and and those industries that supported the German military. And you can see uh, large numbers at, at the, of troops present lined up. Uh, I believe this would be at Nuremberg, uh, where the Nazi Party liked to hold these big rallies. Um, the other thing that Hitler did, following the example of the Japanese, and here's where the Japanese uh, come back in, right? They bombed, uh, they, they, they attacked Manchuria, uh, the League of Nations uh, objected and slapped Japanese hands, the Japanese quit the League. Well, Hitler does the same thing. Uh, he has no time or patience for the League of Nations, which came out of the Paris Peace Conference, so he, too, uh, takes Germany out of uh, the League of Nations. Uh, and he promises the German people that he is going to essentially erase the Treaty of Versailles that had so harshly punished uh, the German people and the German nation. And so what he promises the people, and the people are all too willing to listen, is a return to prosperity, uh, reviving the economy with the military arms build up, and a return to greatness uh, for the German people. So now we have the German peace in place, and we're going to come back to some of the things that uh, Hitler and the Nazi Party were going to do after 1934 and 1935. By the way, one thing I will add at the bottom, point number three, uh, the Nazi Party introduced what were known as racial purity laws in 1935. Those were established uh, in the town of Nuremberg, so they're called the Nuremberg Laws, but they essentially targeted Jews for exclusion uh, from German society. Uh, German, uh, Jews could not attend schools, attend university, they could not work in government positions, they could not work for Aryan people, that is Christian people. So these are the first, this is the first time we see, I think in the 20th century, a, a nation, an advanced, developed nation like Germany, actually passing laws to exclude a class of people, uh, and that would be the Jews. So that's going to set in motion events that will lead then to the Holocaust. We're going to turn our attention now to Italy, the other piece of, of the European puzzle. Uh, Mussolini was himself a, a fascist dictator. Uh, he came to power in Italy, and this is not on the slide, but in 1922, so some three years after uh, the Treaty of Versailles or the Paris Peace Conference concluded. Uh, Italy felt that it had been cheated, deprived uh, of lands that it should have received for fighting in World War I on the side of the Allies. So uh, Mussolini takes advantage of the uh, frustration among the Italian people and again um, economic problems in Italy dating to the 1920, 21, and 22 period that allow Mussolini to come to power. And Mussolini, much like Hitler did 10 years later, established a one-man, one-party state uh, and that is again dictatorship. Um, so what is Mussolini uh, going to do? Well, Mussolini promises his people, the Italian people, a return to greatness. And one of the ways that he does it is to build up the Italian military, such as it was, and also then to use that military in uh, military uh, invasions of other lands. And you can see that uh, the Italians had already controlled parts of Africa, uh, the Eritrean uh, state and the Italian uh, state of Somali, or Somaliland as it was known then. Uh, and in 1935, the Italians launch a massive invasion of Ethiopia. Uh, and they are going to uh, essentially conquer Ethiopia. It was a very one-sided affair. The Ethiopians are fighting on horseback and on camels, using in many cases spears against uh, Italian airplanes, Italian tanks, machine guns, and even uh, poison gas uh, that was used by the Italians on the Ethiopians. Um, naturally, uh, the League of Nations uh, condemns the Italian actions and, of course, uh, Italians and Benito Mussolini uh, are not too scared uh, of the League of Nations at this point. And, and at one point there is a, a very famous speech by the Ethiopian emperor, uh, a man by the name of Haile Selassie, uh, calling to the nations of the world for help. He sends out this SOS, an appeal to the world for help, and of course he got none. Um, so um, that's the situation uh, with Italy as they begin to uh, gear up their military and go on uh, this offensive with their military. So back to Germany. 
So, as I said, uh, we're going to look at the actions of Hitler and the Nazi party. And in 1936, uh, Hitler's first big move in international affairs was to send in German troops that you see down below, uh, and you also see Hitler in his staff car uh, reviewing the troops. Um, they went into an area, a German area called the Rhineland. And the Rhineland was a German area or province uh, or state, really, that was uh, very productive, a lot of industry, a lot of resources. Now, the Rhineland had been taken away from Germany as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. So it was meant to punish Germany. Uh, Germany started the war, that is World War I. We're going to take away the means by which Germany started that war, which was to build a large military using its industrial might. So the idea was to take the Rhineland away from Germany and uh, that the League of Nations would actually govern this little uh, province there that you see, the Rhineland. Well, Hitler said, we're not in the League anymore. I don't like that. That's an invasion of our sovereignty and our territory. So Hitler reoccupies with the troops, with the German troops at the Rhineland. Uh, and this, this sent a clear signal uh, to the world that now Hitler uh, was on the move, as we saw Japan on the move, we saw Italy on the move, and we see now uh, Germany on the move. So the international response is obviously quite negative uh, to this, but again, uh, the international leaders, especially Britain and France, are uh, not really doing much about it. They're not doing much to stop Hitler. Um, there is uh, obviously the problems of the economy and the Great Depression that weighed on the leaders of these other nations, including the United States. So in a sense, Hitler and Mussolini in Japan are taking advantage again of the Great Depression and the economic misery uh, and doing what they're doing. And the international response is uh, fairly weak and not well coordinated. Um, the other thing that we're going to look at is the formation in 1936 of what was the Berlin, Rome, Tokyo axis. And this, this came about in several stages. In October of 1936, Berlin uh, and Rome, that is Hitler and Mussolini, form an agreement of mutual aid in Europe. Then in November of 1936, uh, Berlin and Tokyo, so that would be Hitler and Tojo in Japan, form what was known as the Anti-Comintern Pact. Now, Comintern just simply means communist. So this pact is an anti-communist pact aimed at the Soviet Union and the threat of communism that the Soviet Union represented. Then in 1937, Italy joined the Berlin and Tokyo Agreement thus creating what today is known as the Berlin-Rome-Tokyo axis. And these three powers, again, led by uh, uh, dictators and very militaristic, very aggressive, very ambitious, uh, decide to join forces uh, for the future. So we see what I would, what I would call uh, the, the, the clouds of war, the storm clouds of war, uh, beginning to come together and form in 1936. So we're now going to move to the next event. Uh, in 1936, a civil war broke out in Spain. Uh, Spain had elected by democratic elections, fair and free democratic elections, I would add, a socialist uh, government. Um, and the military in Spain, led by a, name, a man named Francisco Franco, uh, really rejected that idea. They did not like the idea of a socialist government in Spain. So Franco gets the generals and the Spanish military to attack the Spanish government, which was a republican government, and you can see that Izquierda Republicana uh, contra el fascismo internacional. So there's a real uh, uh, a civil war here that would last three years. It was a rather bloody affair. And Hitler and Mussolini both take advantage of this to send German and Italian troops to Spain to aid Franco and the military against the socialist government, the Republic. And this is really kind of a, a proving ground. This is kind of a preseason, if you will, game for both the Italian and the German militaries. Uh, and the German uh, military, in particular, uh, the Air Force, is going to practice using aerial bombardment. And you see uh, a famous painting called Guernica, uh, 1937, uh, by Pablo Picasso. And this was a town, Guernica was actually a town destroyed by German bombs. And again, think about the 
the inhumanity, the brutality of aerial bombardment uh, that does not discriminate against uh, soldier and civilian. You even see animals, parts of bodies uh, that have been arranged by Picasso in his cubist uh, uh, painting technique and style. So this is a very famous work. So again, we have uh, uh, another uh, sort of foreshadowing and taste of a war in the Spanish Civil War. And with that, I think I've run out of my allotted time, so lecture two will end here. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please jot them down, and thank you very much.